Um, does that work? Seems to. Okay, yeah, I'm talking about writing GStreamer plugins. Um, hang on. What's going on here? There we go. Okay. Usually when I talk about GStreamer, I start with this question, which can take a long time. Um, but today, just rewind an hour and you'll get the answer. Um, okay. So what I'll do, uh, I, I was to talk about what the experience of writing a GStreamer plugin is like. Um, but um, I found that quite hard, so I'm actually just going to I'm going to go through some examples and talk about what it was like along the way. Now, one of the things I did, I'm an artist. I make computer computer programs that make art, and um, the first GStreamer plugin I wrote was a transform. Now, it had a camera that looked at this. Worked out a transformation to a projection, and then it would project the negative image onto the um, what it saw in front of it, so that whatever was on the wall would be um, eradicated by the projection, and so. Um, If you walked in front of it, depending on the parallax between the camera and the projection, you, you'd sort of seem to disappear. Um, and so in the exhibition, what I did is I had two projectors and one camera. Um, and so the camera was looking at the, at the screen. And then there were two projectors, like you've got two here, but... In that case, they're both, both pointing at the same rectangle, and they're both the Sparrow plugin, which is the one where it says Sparrows. It would work out. It would work out for each projector um, exactly what, where it was in the camera's view, so that then when something went in front of it, they'd both try and eradicate it. And then the, they were both trying to project Sparrows onto the um, projector, which was. The, much lower than these ones, so people would walk. But they'd, they'd, be, they'd be fighting each other to um, control the screen, and if one of them put a sparrow on it and the other one didn't want it there, it would be putting the negative image. And in some places they, they could agree, like if they both agreed that a part of the screen should be dark, they'd leave it dark. But in other places there's swirly feedback. And then when people went in front of it, there was really feedback, and it was sort of get. It would lead into a um, feedback loop. Um, now I'll try and do a demo. This isn't going to work because there's. Um, there's only one projector, and and each window. So, each one chooses its own colour. Um, to it projects these lines that so can work out the the corners. And then it will try and project the negative image of what it thinks where it thinks its window is um, when it starts going. Uh, possibly it's not going to go because possibly I, I haven't pointed the camera right, or it's not it's not bright enough for it to see. Okay, so I'll forget about that. You really need the the proper hardware setup. Um, so what that was doing is working out like a, a those lines would work out a grid of where it could um, map the camera image onto the projection. Um, now. This is well, this is a pretty straightforward plugin from a GStreamer point of view. It's just it's a subclass is a video filter, 
so there's things that are set up. So you, if you're making something that takes video and then puts video out, a lot of stuff is looked after for you. So there's a lot of boilerplate you have to use. For, for GStream, it's not a lot, but it's... Qu um, Glib and G objects and all that kind of stuff. And... Um, and you can concentrate on your own little bit. Now, the, I, for a long time, I spent ages trying to work out a protocol for the two projections, negotiate which colour they'd use, and for one of them to, they'd flash things, because I need to load up the Sparrow images, they'd flash things um, to try and communicate who was going to pick them up. And then I realised that they're actually both um, the same code and the same shared object, which is what a, a GStreamer plugin is. Um, so, in fact, they just go using mutex, doing it behind the back. Anyway, um, oh, by, by the way, um, in, in GStreamer language, a plugin refers to the library, whereas in, in my, in the, I'm using it to... Um, refer to the kind of like the the bit, which in GStreamer language is called an element. There's all these kind of things where it's a little bit off from what I expect, but um, it's okay. Right now, now this is another. Um, this I made two years ago. Um, Recur is a. Um, a video thing that watches TV and it learns how the video moves and it learns to associate the way that the video moves with um, the sound that is happening at the same time. So it should, like say it sees lots of explosions, it will associate the, the sound of an explosion with the appearance of an explosion. Um, and if it, if it hears lots of talking and there are talking heads at the same time, it should associate those together. Um, it uses a, a recurrent neural network, which I'm actually, I'm talking about recurrent neural networks on Friday, and I'm going to do a, a live demo of it. So I'm not doing it now because I don't want to do all my demos. I, I could actually, there's not many of you, but... Um, I won't. <laughs> um, so in training, it takes um, it watches the video. Okay, it watches the. I've drawn a file. It's a file source. Um, video for Linux source, um, and they both have to go through this element that has a video and an audio thing, and that. Seem quite tricky. Um, what you have to do is you have to write a. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I was just doing my slides before, so they're a bit out of out of order from how I'm talking. Um, here we go. Yeah, you, ha you have to um, write a manager, which is like a wrapper around an audio filter and a video filter, and. Um, then the manager has to synchronize the two of them. So the tricky thing in, in doing this is everything in GStream is all kind of nice and tidy in terms of, in terms of time. So you, you, everything's got a timestamp, so which is good. But then like the audio is coming through in little chunks, just really odd-sized little chunks, depending on your, on your source and the video comes through a frame at a time. But if you're trying to associate this audio that comes with this video at a particular time, you have to wait for the audio to fill up um, for the whole frame, and then you can process that frame. That image isn't very clever, but I'd, I was trying. Um, 
the, one, that, the picture on the left is trying to, trying to show that the audio and the video, they tangle together, forming a model, and then the video drips out of it, which is kind of unrelated. It's not derived directly from the video that comes in or the audio that comes in. Whereas the audio that comes in, it's just also passed through um, because you have to pass something through. Um, so yeah, then in the exhibition, this I was trained up to associate video with audio to generate its own video or to, to model how video moved. Um, in the exhibition, the idea was that there'd be a microphone like hidden in the room. You wouldn't know. And the noises that people made would form as, um, would cause associations to be made in, in the model that would make new video. It would shape the way the noise you made would shape the video that came out. Um, in actual fact, when it came down to the um, exhibition, which like with the exhibitions, there's a hard deadline. There's you know, 50 people working on it, and there's a the mayor's going to come and open it that night, and they couldn't get the sound working, so there was no sound coming in, and it was just um, all of this work I did was a bit pointless. I could have just made a video filter. Anyway. Um, and now, those were art ones. And um, I also worked doing science, sciencey stuff, helping scientists. Um, and I also used GStreamer for that. Now, one of the things I've done is an audio classifier which has the same recurrent neural network core as the previous example. Um, now with that, you need to train it up. Um, you play the file, and you tell it what it's listening to. So one of the things we did, we played it um, speech on the radio, and we told them what language it was in. Um, because there are, there are radio stations in New Zealand, some of them are funded to speak Māori for a certain percentage, percentage of the time. And if they're not speaking that much, they need their funding cut off. Um, and so there's money in, in detecting whether they're speaking enough. Um, and we, so we played them lots of radio, we played the machine lots of radio, and told it what language was on at the moment, and, and, the, and it learnt to... Um, to, to just spit out the answer. Um, and now the way to train it up, if you, if you give it one file at a time, um, which is sort of the natural thing to do, the natural thing to do um, it'll get, because the people speak the same language for minutes, um, it'll, this, it'll be the same answer for minutes. Um, so that, like it'll kind of like it'll think the answer's always over this side, and then suddenly it'll think the answer's always over that side. It's like it's like it goes right to one extreme, then to the other. And what you need is it always to be being pulled both ways at once. Um, and if if you're training an an ordinary neural network, you use sto stochastic gradient descent. Where you, the stochastic thing means you just give it examples in random order, but with a recurrent thing, they're not in random order because it's all about the order. I mean, it's recurrent. Um, so I had to train it on hundreds of files at the same time to, to average out all those effects. And I started off trying to make an element that would take you know, an odd number, any number of audio files and, and um, audio streams, sorry, and it just turned out to be complicated. And then I realized that I could just make it take in one audio stream of 500 channel audio and use the built in interleave um, plugin, which does that mixing down all the ones to, into one. Um, and that's what, like, one of the lessons I've learned is to, to trust as much as I can the, the plugins that exist. Because they, they, like it, they, 
sorry, with 500 files, um, my recurrent neural network uses up one of the CPUs on this old laptop, and the, the rest of it, 500 threads reading from WAV files and interleave, they don't even use up the, they use 70% of the other one. So it's, it's kind of like no, um, there's no overhead in having gazillions of files. Um, and then, and when it's classifying, it just does one file at a time. I, I can do a demo of that. But I won't do the language one. Uh, um, ah, did I do the sound? Yeah. This, this is listening to a, a recording of the bush um, in the Romantaka Forest Park. When it hears a kiwi, there's a kiwi in the background. It goes over that side. And the kiwi calls for about 20 seconds. Can you hear it? Yeah. Um, and then it goes back. Um, I'll see if I can make it play another one. Oh, no, that's enough of that one. Um, and that works at about 1,500 times real speed from a WAV file. Can we can do 1,500 hours of recordings in one hour, um, which is pretty good. Oh, yeah. So the development cycle of, of everything I do, actually. But, uh, G Stream quite often makes me cross. That's, um, uh, uh, um, it says things like, um, you know, if something doesn't work, it says reason not linked. And then you look back through the logs, and this tells you a lot of things, but you know, you, it never quite tells you, never quite tells me exactly why it wasn't linked. Well, at least I think it's not. I think it's not. And then, so, um, I spend a lot of time looking at it, and I'm about to go on the ISC channel, the hash G streamer, and say, this isn't working. And then I get there, and, I'm, and I think I have to put this question in G streamer terms that they'll understand, and I kind of compose it, and, and then I think, oh, but I haven't tried this, because once, once, you, once you start putting it in their language, and then I, so I try the thing that, um, you know, I'm just doing to, to, to cover the first question that I know I'm going to get, and it works. So, um, and then I'm happy again. Uh, um, the things that, once it's going, it's really good. It, it just, uh, um, like, like, like the exhibition with the um, video machine that, that didn't use the sound, but was trying to, um, that ran for four months, and you know I just turned it on. I was screwed to the ceiling. There was no, there was no um, keyboard or connect, internet connection or anything, and it was not a different city for me. And it, it ran for it ran for three and a half months, and the disc died. But the G streamer kept on going after the disc died. Um, the documentation doesn't always make me happy. Um, Like this is a documentation page. It says read this first, but you don't want to read that first. Usually, <laughs> well, if, if you're making a plugin, you read the plugin um, writer's guide. But the thing that I, I, when I'm making a pipeline, the page I always go to is this one, which is an over, overview of all plugins. And so you, you, you've got to jump all about to find it. And then there it is. And you kind of find the, the plugin that sounds like the thing that you want. 
and then um, there's no way back to this page it's because this is generated by GTK doc and from GStreamer's point of view everything belongs in a um, they have the good plugins and they have the bad plugins and the ugly plugins and the base plugins and from the documentation point of view at the top of the tree is this is the good plugins documentation tree when you, you don't care whether they think it's in the good you just want to know all the plugins you can use um, and there's just no way to get back out to the, the rest of the plugins um, but the, once you get there usually you get something good like this interleave has got quite a lot of words um, that are probably saying useful things long long examples and um, how much time am I using oh, yeah. I'll, I'll probably I'll probably run out of things to say that's okay um, you can get more or less the same stuff with this yeah, um, yeah Jan was actually talking a lot about a lot of these things um, you can get a picture of of what your your pipeline looks like it's quite useful um, and the GST debug thing he was talking about that now the trouble with the, like the GST debug viewer it's really good but you um, they've sort of brought it a little bit into the fold now but for a long time it was in some weird it wasn't it wasn't mentioned on the GStreamer website it, it was kind of like so you only heard about it through GStreamer law you know like you, you know if you hung out on the IRC channel or you or um, read the mailing list and the, and a lot of the a lot of the documentation a lot of the knowledge involved in writing GStreamer plugins and using GStreamer is just kind of just in, in a whole lot of people's heads who have been doing it for a decade and um, it's hard for them to see exactly how to, to communicate to um, the newcomers and like the, the mailing list read, you know it's frequently asked questions except that every question is just slightly different so they can't just write it down it's like there's, there's core cool concepts which are always being addressed and and it, it's sort of impossible to um, for anyone to you have to not comprehend them to understand that you need to comprehend them and then once you comprehend them you don't go back and, um, and so it should be people like me who are, who are doing the, um, the documentation patching except you know when I'm in the middle of it trying to write a plugin or you know finish the pipeline and there's five hours to go to the deadline and stuff like that I don't feel like going through the process and then afterwards I don't care and um, I've, done, I've done a little bit um, the yeah, plugin writer's guide is quite useful the, and uh, you can see I've you know I've looked at quite a lot of, lot of it um, but some of it looks like this <laughs> good um, it was useful. <laughs> I've, I've talked about that. And another, this is, from the outside, a plugin is all about making it easy. Um, so that, um, you know, it's easy for Python to, to work out what's going on. And that may, means it makes it correspondingly harder on the inside like there's all the G object stuff you go through a lot of hoops to, to set a number on um, this is just a patch just adding one little option on one of my plugins um, um, and that's not even actually doing anything like, like where it says XXX down the bottom that's where you actually have to do the stuff to um, but sometimes you have to do, do a lot of stuff because um, if things happen in the wrong order, you need to save up your your, pro your properties and stuff like that. Um, 
but then when you when you come to the outside, you do do this funny stuff. You don't understand what you know, all these things beginning with G R, and um, like you know the G param spec float. You, you write the same string twice, and you don't really know why, and all that kind of stuff. But then when you you don't have to do anything for it to turn up, and when you're using Python or whatever language as a G streamer plugin, um, so you kind of pay while you're writing the plugin with some obscure stuff that I don't understand. <laughs> it's not like writing C. It's it's like writing it's well, it's like writing the um, G objects and stuff. And that's yeah. Questions. Yes, um, and C. I, th I think you pretty much no. We you can do. I've heard you can do it in Python, um, but you could do audio. I think would be feasible, but I don't. You could you could write some um, plugins in Python. It depends what you want to do. There are limitations in the way that our bindings are written that make some operations hard to do. Yeah. Generally, you uh, yeah, write your elements and plugins in C. Okay. I, I have written Python plugins for some time. Um, I'll just say the question was, what language was I, was I using, and what languages can you use? And the answer was, you can do some stuff in Python. <laughs> in terms of writing the uh, plugins, have you found that it was more easier for one type of things, say like the image processing or? Is, is there one part that could be improved on the most, or what are your thoughts when writing them? Um, so the video is nicer in a way than the audio for the things I do. Um, it's all contingent on what you're doing. But with the video, you, you can guarantee to get a frame at a time, which is what you want. With the audio, um, if you're doing something, analysing it, you need a, a, a certain chunk size, but it comes through it in, in its own little sizes. Which I don't. Maybe there's a maybe there's a plugin that um, will do that to it. But, but um, yeah, so video is easier in a way. All right, so if we've uh, got no further questions, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.